good morning, everybody, or for some people, it might be a good afternoon or a good evening. So wherever you're joining us from, good morning, good afternoon or good evening. Um, welcome to our online seminar. My name is Gail Wilson and I'm the Centre Manager for the Centre for Sustainable, Healthy and Learning Cities and Neighbourhoods. And we are very glad that you could join us today. We've got a really good event lined up to, for you today. Um, before I hand over to our chair, I would just like to briefly mention some housekeeping for today. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you have already been attending lots of webinars like this, but just very quickly to go over go over some housekeeping to make sure that we run as smoothly as possible. Um, please ensure that your microphone is muted during the presentations. And because we've got a lot of people joining from all over the world, if you could turn your video off if you're not presenting so that we can free up bandwidth to make sure that everybody can join. If you have any technical difficulties, please just um, put a message in the chat room and we'll try and help you. Um, we've got three presenters today um, who are going to present their research from Bangladesh and then after that we're going to open it up to um, question and answer so you can ask questions to the panel. Please just pop your question in the chat room. You can ask your questions as we're going along and I will then pass them to the chair who will ask the panel later on after the presentations. So without further ado, um, let's start the seminar. So over to you, Professor Mike Osborne, our chair for today. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the seminar. My, um, my script tells me I have three minutes um, uh, for, for this introduction. Uh, it might be a couple of minutes more, but welcome to all of you. Um, this is um, a, a webinar um, entitled Exploring Livability in Regional Cities in Bangladesh. And uh, I'm, I'm going to let the presenters have most of the time today, obviously. Um, but let me say just a little bit about the basis of this work, uh, which is um, part of the activities of the Centre for Sustainable, Healthy Learning Cities and Neighbourhoods, uh, based here in, in Glasgow, uh, a collaboration uh, between uh, a, a number of units here in Glasgow crossing health, education, and urban studies, and importantly, uh, a, a lot of um, partners from around the world that I'll say something about uh, in a moment. So uh, this slide that you see here uh, essentially um, talks about um, why it's important uh, to, to study cities and particularly to study cities um, at, at, at a neighbourhood level, which has been the focus of our work, focusing on health, education and sustainable development. Um, these are the cities we work with, uh, which, which cross uh, seven different countries. Um, and as you can see in, in the Philippines, India, uh, China, Bangladesh, Tanzania, Rwanda and, and South Africa, uh, those are the specific cities that we've been looking at. We're uh, just over three years uh, in, into the project now. Um, and if you look at the SHLC website, you can see much more detail of what we're doing generally. Um, as I've indicated, it's um, interdisciplinary research, uh, collaborative um, and essentially um, what this slide here is saying that collaboration is really important um, sustainability at urban level depends on um, a, a variety of different services being brought together including health and, and learning which we are uh, looking at in some detail um, a very important part of, of this work and i should say the work is being funded by um, UK, UK Research and Innovation, uh, which is the funder for research uh, across the whole of the UK. And it's inside the Global Challenges Research Fund, which is an enormous investment um, in the billions from the UK government uh, to, to, to focus on global challenges. An important part of all projects um, is, is capacity strengthening. And we're engaged in a whole range of different capacity strengthening events, um, which include uh, visiting programs for research fellows, mentoring of our own staff and, and, and others. And, and most importantly, um, what we're focusing on today 
is a fund that we have called the Capacity Development Acceleration Fund, um, which funds a range of activities, including the Research Fellowship Program, uh, but, but small projects around the world, bits of pilot research, knowledge mobilization, uh, et cetera, which focus on and develop uh, the core program of SHLC. Um, We've, we've funded projects in all continents and it's really a great pleasure that today we're able to focus on what we think has been one of our most successful projects, um, uh, which our colleagues are going to talk about quite shortly. And so that final slide there uh, just gives you some links. You can follow us on Twitter. You can come to our website. You can email us and there's, there's regular news items. So I will stop my screen sharing now and you might be able to see me. Um, and um, this is just proof there's, there, there is some life uh, after or during COVID, uh, particularly in the plant world and those are the strawberries uh, from, from my own garden, which were picked this morning. And now let me then just go on to say a little bit about our speakers today. Um, and the project uh, that we're that we're focusing on. Um, so the, the livability regional cities in Bangladesh project is an interdisciplinary exploration of of two regional coastal cities, Mongla and Noapara in southwestern Bangladesh, uh, where from the perspectives of residents, officials, and stakeholders. And the the project, as you'll hear. Uh, shortly used interdisciplinary methods, including storytelling workshops, surveys, photo essays, semi-structured interviews and focus group discussions in order to understand residents' interpretation of livability. The, 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 the researchers did an awful lot of work in a relative short period of time. Um, and they'll talk a bit more about this household surveys a hundred of those uh, semi-structured interviews, 40 of those, as well as the theater workshops and so on. So overall, the study explored how residents in each city, as I've said, perceive their neighborhood and what their priorities are in making their city livable. That's enough from me. So I should now just introduce our speakers. Um, Anna Rushik from the Institute of Hazard Resili Risk and Resilience, the Department of Geography at Durham University. Ishtiak Ahmed, the International Center for Climate Change and Development, Independent University in Bangladesh, and Alex Hallengay from the University of Witzvaterland in Johannesburg. So that's enough from me, and let me now just hand over uh, to, to our first speaker. So Anna, are you gonna kick off? Yep, I will, thank you. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. I'm going to um, share my slide with you now, or share my screen with you, maybe. Okay. Hello. It's really hard to do a Zoom uh, presentation, um, so you have to bear with me while I do this. Um, my name is Hannah Dustrick. I work at uh, Durham University and the Institute of Hazard Risk and Resilience. And before that, I was a practitioner for the UN and I worked for the ILO and the UNDP in different countries. And above all, I want to thank SHLC for funding our project and for giving us this opportunity to present our work to you. Um, my research interests um, are related to cities. I'm an urban geographer. And I'm really interested in these smaller cities around the world, which is actually where the bulk of the world's population lives. It's not in the mega cities. I'm interested in the intersection of people's everyday lives and also events that occur. You know, these events might be natural hazards such as Cyclone Amphan. It might be a change in municipal status. And I'm also interested in creating a space in my research um, for the eyes and ears um, the views of the invisible majority, the world's populations that live in these smaller cities. So this research project that we're going to be talking about today um, 
was developed by these three people. So Alex uh, on the far left, uh, Faisal Rah Alex, who has a specialty in arts and humanities, uh, Faisal Rahman, um, who's also um, a co-I, has an engineering background, um, and he worked for the International Center for Climate Change and Development, and now he's at Durham University, and myself. So we got the funding last May uh, 2019, and then we met um, by chance in uh, June to talk about our project. Um, our research is in small cities. So this is a map of Bangladesh with um, highlighted the largest uh, cities, the largest seven cities. And then for comparison, these are our two project sites, Noapada and Mangla both of which are in the southwestern part of uh, Bangladesh. Noapada has about 170,000 people, and it's, and it's an important transportation junction for rail, uh, train, and uh, waterways. And Mangla is near the Sundarbans, which are important for climate change mitigation. And Mangla is a, is a bit of a sleepy town, has about 100,000 people. Uh, but what's quite important is that Mangla is in the vision of the central government. And so they're focusing on an export um, processing zone and also the Mangla port is there. So Mangla, the export processing zone has about 7,000 employees. Um, and one thing that I didn't mention about Noapada, which I think is quite interesting, is that in Noapada, there's about 100,000 people who move daily from the rural areas into the urban for employment. So there's quite interesting linkages between the rural and the urban there. So this is a picture of our project team, um, which was quite a big uh, team. At, at some points, there was about um, 10 to 11 of us working on the project. Before I go into the field work, I, I want to really briefly mention the history of the concept of livability, which is what brought us to these regional cities. So livability as a concept has been around since the 1950s. Originally, it was um, used to understand why do people live in certain spaces. But over time, especially in the 1990s and in the 2000s, livability became a way to rank cities and to compare cities to each other in a, qual in a quantitative manner. Most of this work has been done by the private sector. And the audience of these rankings historically has been the elite, the urban elite or the global elite. It hasn't been used as a way to think through cities for, for a cross section of society that lives in these cities. So through our project, we're trying to move away from or we have moved away from a quantitative ranking of cities rather we're trying to use this interdisciplinary way to think through you know who's living in these cities what do they find important and what can we think through in terms of policy and advocacy work from this type of a of an engagement um, through the project, we've tried to build the capacity of, um, of young scholars. Um, we've spent quite a bit of time in building the capacity of master's students from Kulna University, from different universities in Dhaka, in the arts, in the humanities, in the social sciences. So we've done quite a bit of, um, of, of, um, of, of deep knowledge exchange as well through this project. So now I am going to present to you uh, my amateurish film of my personal reflections of what I've learned from livability in these two cities. So this film is about four minutes long and then I will continue um, with my presentation. What I learned through the concept of livability. When I first thought about the concept of livability, I thought it might be a way to hear people's views about the cities they live in. Based on the academic literature I read, I had thought livability would be comprised of years, livelihoods and food security, utilities and transport, health and natural environment, education, housing, central and local government, safety and security, and lastly, social and leisure aspects of life.
So I developed a project titled The Livable Regional Cities in Bangladesh with two colleagues, one from South Africa and one from Bangladesh. The project was an interdisciplinary exploration of Mangla and Nawapada, two regional cities impacted by disasters and climate change, both located in southwestern Bangladesh. In this project, we listened to the views of middle class residents, as well as residents in informal settlements, government officials, and stakeholders in the cities. The concept of livability shows the complexity of life. It means different things to people based on the intersectionality of gender, education, income levels, as well as other factors. What I learned was that some of the spheres were more important than others, but some spheres were just not that important at all. From 200 surveys with middle income and informal settlement dwellers, I learned the four most important factors for livability are housing, utilities, livelihoods, as well as safety and security. For the middle class residents, education for their children is a particularly important aspect of livability for them. From the storytelling workshops, I learned that women believe marrying at a young age puts them and their children at a distinct disadvantage of their husbands leaving them and then remarrying. In Mongla, where there is a significant and severe water crisis, people say water is life. Without water, there is no life. From the photography aspect of the project, I learned about the need for solid waste management. We know local government officials care about this, but oftentimes do not have the money to purchase land for solid waste management facilities. Overall, I learned that in spite of difficulties in their lives, people in both cities loved their city. Reflecting on people's views of their cities, with the overall problematic situation that they face in terms of water access, environmental destruction, and very difficult working environments, shows the complexity of life in regional cities. This interdisciplinary interpretation of the concept of livability has presented a multiplicity of views on what makes a city livable. If you want to learn more about the Livable Regional Cities in Bangladesh project, or if you want to talk about livability, please contact me, Anna Rushtri. Okay. So that was the presentation, that was the, the, the film that I made. Um, for this last bit of my part of the presentation, um, I want to talk about the findings of the project. Um, I've put this chart here for you to show you um, the details that we've been able to gather through this research. We have over um, 260 um, charts, graphs, pie charts from the survey of 200 um, middle class and lower income residents um, in the two cities. And all of this information is, ex is um, accessible on ECAD's website, which East Jack will talk about in a, um, in a later presentation. So in terms of academic outputs, um, the team um, has written um, one paper for an urban journal, a second paper for um, thinking through the methods that we've used and the, inter and the aspects, the interdisciplinary aspects that we've used and, and what do they actually show. And we've written a short reflections piece on ethics um, for a journal that is interested in um, ethics of, um, of projects. Um, and the title of the ethics piece is Ethics as Negotiated and Emergent in a Comparative Study of Livability in Small Cities. We've also written different blogs and we're in the process of writing a piece for the conversation. There's three main findings, academic findings. The first is that livability is contextual. It, it, it should not be quantified. 
um, there's a difference between thinking about cities that are viable and livable and also um, the temporality of livability is really important to consider um, when we use this phrase. Our research shows or argues for rethinking the contemporary underlying conceptual framings of the livability discourse. A qualitative and interdisciplinary study of the concept of livability presents a fuller reading of the complexity of life in areas or cities that are underexplored in urban research. And it's these cities that are rapidly growing and changing. Livability provides a lens to show how residents view their cities, not only today, but also what residents see as their future in these cities. The Bangladeshi cities that were explored can be considered as viable with elements of livability. The possibility is open for, for further research that can be framed outside of this global north, global south binary, which invokes qualitative aspects of livability that can bring a multiplicity of cities into conversation with each other beyond rankings. A qualitative interdisciplinary reading of livability provides a lens in which we can gain insights into the opinions, values, aspirations of the increasing number of people who intentionally reside in these small cities and who are not particularly interested in migration to larger cities. Livability cities, livable cities as a conceptual framing requires further critical attention and care. But in our opinion, a world of livable cities can be created, maintained, if residents, local governments, and our cities are given a chance. So in closing um, my part of the presentation, um, I wanted to say, again, thank you to SHLC for funding our project. Um, one of the things that I'm particularly proud of is that because we got this funding for livability um, in the small cities, we've been able to cascade that work into other um, work that we're doing right now as a team on COVID-19 and the and implications of lockdown and food security in these two same small cities. So again, we're rethinking about, you know, how do you do research in a situation of a lockdown and where people can't, um, can't move. But the findings that we're getting from this new work is really, really um, fruitful as well. Um, so I think that's it for me. Um, that's my Durham website. There's also on this sheet, you can also see my website and there's the IHR Twitter handle and my handle as well. Um, so now I'm gonna pass on um, the baton to Alex, um, who's going to talk about the methods in more detail. Thank you. And I'm going to stop sharing. Great. Thanks, Hannah. And I am gonna start sharing. So I'm gonna be talking in a little bit more detail about the methods we used. Wait. Sorry, I just want to check that. Yes, I'm sharing the right thing. Good. Um, so my name is Alex Hallagy, and I am a South African academic. And as Hannah's already said, I work with arts methodologies um, and exploring everyday life in city spaces. So, and I am based, I'm a postdoctoral fellow with the South African Research Chair in Spatial Analysis and City Planning um, at the School of Architecture and Planning. Stuart Oh, and I just want to check that I've shared my sound. Give me a moment. Share computer sound. Great. Okay. So, um, So here's a list of the tools we've heard, we, we used, which you will have already heard something of. Um, 200 household surveys, 40 semi-structured interviews, two focus group discussions, four storytelling workshops, which resulted in two street theater performances, and then photo photography and video documentation of public and private spaces. So broadly, our tools were falling into two categories. We had methods conventionally associated with the social sciences, and methods conventionally used in arts-based research processes within humanities. So talking about the household surveys first, 
but these were conducted in the September of 2019 by three ECAD researchers and then three social science students from the University of Kulna, which you would have seen on Hannah's map. So Kulna is the divisional capital, is a divisional capital, and it, it sits between Mangla and Noapara. So these surveys had 13 questions and we configured them around the eight factors for livability that Hannah described in her short video. So the surveys, though we also saw them as structured containers, but for conversations that more might fall outside of what those questions covered. And on a kind of meta research level, the most interesting reflection that the surveyors said participants in the, the, the surveys made was that they had never considered the concept of livability before, nor what makes their cities livable or not, and that that process felt interesting and valuable to them. Which was a lovely reflection and uh, something that was affirmed the value of the work, not only for informing local governments and national governments, but the value for the, the residents of the cities themselves. Our second tool was semi-structured interviews, and I've included in this also our focus group discussions. So these were done in the last two weeks of October, and at the same time as the storytelling workshops, the street theater, and the photography and film work. The interviews were conducted by myself, Hannah, and Faisal, um, and then various ECAD researchers at different, for different interviews who were acting as local experts and also critically interpreters for Hannah and myself. So we had several intentions with the interviews. First of all, to get a sense of the context and life world of the person we were speaking to. We used the eight factors of livability as a kind of loose guide for the conversations. We wanted to test the most common responses that we were, that we were getting a sense that had come out of the survey data. So at this point, we were just working with raw data. It hadn't been disaggregated, it hadn't been analyzed, but it gave us a sense of what kinds of issues were coming up for residents of each city. And then we wanted to test surveyors' impressions of each city, what we were hearing from other interviewees, and what was coming out of the storytelling workshops. The storytelling workshops and street theater performances, so these had four stages. Uh, I developed the structure for this and I co-facilitated it with a Bangladeshi colleague, Abdur Rajak. So the workshop one, the first day was, uh, we used mime, storytelling with actions, acting out little scenes, for people to start talking about water, food, domestic and public spaces, education and health. And then we played games that were more open-ended in terms of the content they brought up. So asking participants to tell each other stories from their childhood, from their present life, and something they would imagine for their future. Also to talk about their experiences at different times of day, of the week, and of the year. And to name one thing they would change about their city and one thing they would keep the same. So in this way, we were really working with the temporality that Hannah was talking about, her livability is something that keeps shifting over time. And it's something we can look at retrospectively and we can project into the future. That afternoon, uh, Rajak and I would put together a structure that could contain all of the material that had come out from the participants. And then the next day in workshop two, we would rehearse the participants into the structure we had created. We'd set out immediately to a public spot that we had all agreed on with the participants and we would perform there. In, in the public spaces. Rajak played a kind of choral narrator, chorus leader narrator role to give con a containing structure for the participants to perform within. Then we returned to the workshop venue immediately after the street theater performances and had a debrief. And this was absolutely critical for us all because this was the point where we could really see what participants felt was valuable in expressing their views on livability and expressing them through theater and performance games and then being able to perform these views in public spaces. Our last tool was photography and film and these took place concurrently with the semi-structured interviews and the storytelling and the street theater performances. We had two filmmaker students from the Independent University of Bangladesh and they were our primary photographer and filmmaker but the whole team were taking photos and making short videos throughout our research process. So what were we documenting? Public spaces we passed through, traveling between interviews and the workshops. And our two visual documenters also spent a couple of hours in each city with a, with a participant recording their domestic surrounds and their daily activities. And then they were documenting the storytelling workshops and street theater performances. 
So I'm now going to show you a short video, five and a half minutes, which draws together all of this material. It's hung on the narrative of the storytelling workshops, but it also gives a really strong flavor of the public and private spaces we were documenting through our research. In the September and October of 2019, the Liverpool Regional Cities in Bangladesh project studied Mangla and Noapara in the division of Kulna, Southwest Bangladesh. Using surveys and semi-structured interviews, we investigated what residents in the middle class and low income brackets and local officials and stakeholders consider makes their cities livable. We also conducted participatory theatre workshops with a small group of residents in each city. Here, residents shared their daily experiences through physical and verbal storytelling, culminating in short street theatre performances. This video shows you something of the theatre workshop process first in Mangla and then in Noapara.
talk a little bit about the ethics of engagement in our methods. So our shared ethical intention as a team of interdisciplinary scholars was to collaborate with people in each city, to hear their views on what constitutes livability for them, how the expectations of livability are and are not being met in their cities. We wanted the research process to give participants voice and for the research data and its dissemination to advocate for residents and local stakeholders to policymakers. And this is something that Ishtiak is going to discuss more fully shortly. Using mixed methods led to discussions from our relative interdisciplinary viewpoints about the ethical use of each tool, and it enabled an attentiveness to negotiating the ethics of engagement moment to moment in the research. So there's a lot more that I could say about uh, our mixed methods, but I've pulled out these three points in, in to, to make the best use of this limited time we have. So, these methods triangulated the research data, corroborating it, detailing it, and sometimes productively complicating it. In a kind of shareability between methods, each one showed up data not normally associated with that method. So for example, the surveys gave qualitative feels of each city. The storytelling workshops brought some factual information to light. In a small scale fast turnaround project, the mixed methods allowed for a deeper, more self-reflexive engagement than would have been possible with a single discipline set of tools. And this is my research unit, and you can see my details there if you are interested uh, in any more information, particularly about the theatre and arts-based methods that we used in the research. Thank you so much, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand over to Ishtiak. Hello everyone, I uh, hope you all can see my slides here. So uh, this is Istiak Ahmed, I'm coordinating the resi Library Resilience Program at International Center for Climate Change and Development. Uh, in a nutshell, what we do in our center, uh, ECAT is a research and capacity building organization and we mostly work in climate change and development issues. Uh, uh, most of the partners that we work with are universities, different think tanks around the world and different event bodies. From this project, we have uh, produced several outputs, as Hannah and Alex mentioned. Uh, include, uh, primarily, we have produced two policy briefs, uh, one for Mongla and one for Noapara, that are uh, situated uh, on the left side of the slide that you can see. So this briefs has uh, shared the key findings that we have from this project and some policy suggestions. We also have produced uh, two video documentaries that you already have seen now, one explaining what a livability concept meant to us from this project and one showing the theater performances. We also have published one newspaper article in a national newspaper from this project. At the same time, we have produced uh, one 
survey document, uh, detailed survey document, uh, producing graph from e for each uh, questions, and it's really long, 110 page long, that where you can find all the findings from each uh, questions. At the same time, we have uh, selected 40 photographs from the photography tool that we have used in this project, and we have. Uh, the entire team was involved in selecting those photos and writing the captions for it. From the hard copies, uh, we have made hard copies and uh, handed over to the local authorities, national authorities, uh, participants, as well as to the respondents. And we also have organized two photo exhibitions that I will discuss uh, more later on. All the outputs are available at our ECAD website. The link is below, you can see now. So we have organized four dissemination events, one at the Kulna University with the faculty members and students, two at the two study sites, Mongla and Nwapara, and one at, in Dhaka with the National uh, Municipal Association Bangladesh. And we also have organized two photo exhibition. So when we were planning this dissemination events, uh, the different worlds, uh, many countries, Many countries are already dealing with the COVID-19 situation, but uh, we didn't have a single case in Bangladesh. But unfortunately, right before a week, right before the events, a week before the event, actually, we had our first case in Bangladesh and Hannah had to cancel her flight to Bangladesh. She was supposed to join in the dissemination events, but she couldn't come. Uh, at the same time, within a week, we had few suspected cases and unfortunately one was in Kulna University and then Kuala University management, they have restricted, they had restricted all the public gatherings in the university. However, the URP department, they hosted us and few of the faculty and students uh, sat with us in a meeting room and we shared our findings with them. Fortunately, we were in a good communication with the department since they're also a part of HLC project. They're also a partner of HHLC. So throughout the project, we shared our methodologies, primary findings with them, and they were well aware of our activities. But still, we shared our uh, two video documentaries, all the graphs that we produced, and they really appreciated how much we have achieved within six months. Later on, we uh, organized two local level dissemination events, one with the municipalities in Mongla and one with the municipalities in Nuapara. Both the event were really well attended and uh, had a really good discussion. Uh, I will uh, share key points from each dissemination event later on. This is uh, just to explain what are, what are the dissemination event we have we had. Then afterwards, we had uh, a national dissemination event in Dhaka, where we shared our findings with the Municipal Association Bangladesh. Bangladesh. Uh, this is a national association with all the municipal chairmen and members and secretaries <coughs> being uh, part of it. So we have shared our findings, uh, we have shared our documentaries, and we also have handed over all the photographs that we have printed out to them. Apart from these uh, dissemination events, we organized two uh, photo exhibition at the premises of the dissemination event so that people can see the pictures and uh, read the caption. The captions were in Bangla, so all the community members, uh, they also came and what, saw all the pictures and read the captions. Since it was in the municipalities and it already always gets a lot of visitors every day, so a lot of people visited that premises and uh, had a look on those photographs as well as all the participants who attended in the dissemination event. And they all appreciated because uh, one observation from a uh, chairman was we all see these areas every day. We walk past these areas every day, but we don't really notice because it's our everyday life. You are watching this every day. But when someone take a picture and point it out in front of us, it gets more clear what are the problems in these scenarios. So they really appreciated the effort to organize the photo exhibition from our side. So, so while organizing uh, these uh, events and uh, presenting it to the uh, authorities and the community people, we had a lot of observations uh, from the discussion and presenting it to them. One was local versus uh, central. So in both the cases in the local administration, they shared that 
the local uh, municipal they also struggle a lot to implement different initiatives that they want to do in those areas and one problem they always face or often face is local uh, government versus the central government uh, for an example the mongla mayor he was sharing he wanted to build a formal settlement for the informal group uh, settlements that they have in mongla and that he chose a field land for that but that didn't get approval from the central government because central government had a different plan for that land so and he already had a financial source a resource for that plan but he had to return that money so there are some uh, difficulties uh, or i will say miscommunication between local and central government at the same time in a locality there are different sectors which are responsible to different government agencies and often time coordination among these agencies are a difficulties that the local government faces for example in noapara there is an informal settlement uh, just by the railway tracks and while talking about or discussing around that in informal settlement with the municipalities they mentioned since it's in the railway land the municipality doesn't have much to do with that land or they cannot uh, make anything or cannot plan anything on that land so it has to be railway department who will be able to do anything with that land also sensitivity uh, with the cultural and political agenda it was an observation from our side while presenting it uh, our findings to the uh, authorities and the uh, community people well they already uh, they all kind of appreciated and agreed with all of our findings or at least most of our findings the film you seen later on with the theater performance you have noticed there is a scene where few people are asking job from a broom initially we didn't have any plan to use that broom we wanted to use a branch tree branch which is kind of an object uh, and the intention was to show when they have tired of asking for job to the people they are asking it to the different objects so that that's how desperate they are for a job but uh, it was a very rainy day yeah, we couldn't manage a tree branch and we had to use a broom whatever were, that was available to us so we used that broom but out of all the findings uh, the local authorities in mongla they got really offended from that broom because they said like it's really offending to us because people are asking uh, to a broom and broom is supposed to be a demeaning object for them so we always have to be very careful what when we were doing our research and our showing or developing any documentaries around that uh, local areas at the same time since municipalities are elected body they are highly political and they always have a political agenda to move forward while presenting uh, any issues or problems from that area they often get defensive because it doesn't always uh, look good on their political agenda and that's why we have to be we were, we were really careful and we started the presentation with all the positive things that are going on in that area at the same time we didn't say it's a problem but we kind of presented it in a way that there are further opportunities to improve in these, these areas but still in few cases they can get offended because it's uh, kind of goes around uh, against their political agenda also when we were presenting our findings to the national government the, the national uh, authorities one thing they said like there is a big difference between policies and practices because in policy paper we have a very good local government system where it is divided into many tiny areas which they call ward and then each ward has an elected member who is supposed to do ward shaba which is kind of community uh, discussion session in every six months where, where all the community member is supposed to share all their problems what they need what their demand is and then the member is supposed to share it to the local municipalities and eventually it will go to the sub district district and to the central level but it's still in the paper in many in most cases it's not happening and that's where the main problem is so even though we have good policies we have problems in practice so we have to look at the practice side more in future visibility creates more impact i already have shared a bit of that is when we did the video documentary we showed the video documentary uh, with the photo exhibition it got more attention than the graphs than the uh, lectures or the on the speech i have given or the shared findings or, uh, to them because when they see things it feels more real and then it they kind of get more concerned 
that was one of learning and that was i think one of the benefit of using multidisciplinary methods inclusion of community people develop a sense of accountability in our dissemination event we invited a lot of our respondents and participants in the theater group and in the theater performances so they were uh, kind of in the meeting while they were, were having a discussion in few cases when different government authorities try to deny or get defensive from a few problems the local people the respondents they spoke out and they say like that's not the case what you were saying now because uh, maybe it's in your area but in our area it's very, very different for an example in noapara we were having a discussion around the air pollution and uh, one member said like we don't have any air pollution in noapara so one lady, uh, I will go back to a slide to show a picture to you. So this lady uh, in the red scarf, she spoke out and she was really confident while she was saying like, no, it's not the case what you are saying. There are uh, a lot of problems with air because there are several coal, uh, in the river port, there are several dumping zone of coal and that creates a lot of problem for us. So having community people in the authoritative discussion or uh, decision-making plan, it creates an account, sense of accountability, but the authority cannot go, uh, say, uh, cannot go out saying uh, wrong things or like misinterpreting things. What matters to whom? So out of this dissemination events, what we have learned, uh, even from a pro research project, different stakeholder gets, uh, tries to get different things for an example, the local authorities, they want, really want to understand what is the problem, what is the root cause of those problems and how we can solve it. And then what could be the financial resources to solve those problems. Similarly, the national authority, they are also concerned about the financial resources. At the same time, they want to see how these financial resources get controlled because what they were discussing uh, a lot of, in a lot of cases, a good number of finances goes from the central government, but doesn't really reach the local government as it was supposed to reach. At the same time, the national authority is also interested in looking at the bigger problems. So while discussing these issues, only in Mongla and Noapara, they were thinking of about the whole coastal region, entire northern region, and they want to discuss those problems as well, how the entire coastal region is dealing with those problems. But with the academia, they are, interested in a different uh, thing. They want to really understand the concept of livability and they are focusing on the methodology. How, what are the methodologies we are using to under, understand the livability uh, to look at the problems, which is also very important. Uh, uh, with the community people, they want a voice at that authority. They want to be included in the policy planning. They want to uh, have their voice heard by the authority and see a reflection in the policy planning. At the same time, they want to see fair development. They want to see uh, there is no biasness where they are getting benefits out of the government uh, departments. So uh, no political biasness, no uh, family biasness. So they want to see a fair development that everyone gets a fair um, uh, share. Going forward from this project, we have continued working in Mongla and Noapara with uh, some other projects that we have at ECAD. We also already, Hannah has mentioned that we're already working on a project called COVID-19 and food security in the same area with the same respondent where we are trying to uh, see how those respondents are getting impacted by the lockdown and COVID-19 situation and how their food security, food entire food system is getting impacted, how it's different before the lockdown when we did the livability project and how it's uh, getting impacted now, how it's different now when we are interviewing them over phone. At the same time, we already have submitted a proposal. We really want to build capacity of local authority and researchers on multidisciplinary research tool. We have uh, learned that this multidisciplinary research tool can be very benefiting to understand the concept of livability and solving different problems in the areas. And going forward, we want to understand the entire chain of financial resources to the local government. This was actually a request from the National Dissemination Event the Municipal Association of Bangladesh, they requested us to do another research on the entire chain of financial resource that goes to the local government. What are the resources that we can use to strengthen local government? This is uh, all from my side. I want to mention that all the event pictures were taken by Sohail. 
be insightful uh, and all the other pictures are taken by me. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you. Thank you to everyone. And um, I'm sure everyone agrees those were very good and interesting interesting presentations. We've had a number of complimentary remarks already in the, in the chat box uh, on your presentations. Now, we've had quite a few questions and I'm going to direct um, those questions to Hannah in the first instance and and then I will let her distribute them to 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 the other speakers as as she sees fit. So we have um, a couple of questions from from Richard Clark, who is a researcher at the FIA Foundation in London, whose work focuses on uh, issues of, uh, of of travel and particularly um, safe and healthy journeys to school for children in developing countries. So his first question, Hannah, is how does livability relate to positive psychology and ideas of well-being? Hello. Um, first of all, thank you everyone for all the questions and the comments. Those are really, um, they're, they're really useful for us um, as a project team. Um, so I think I'm going to um, maybe hit on a few questions and then um, maybe Alex and Ishtiak, you can pick which questions you respond to as well. Um, 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 Anna, would, oh, you just, would you just deal with questions one by one? Okay. Okay, um, so if you could deal with Richard's question first of all. Or, or okay, one. then I'll be really quick with Richard's question. Um, I think that um, there are very strong linkages between the concept of livability, well-being, um, and, and psychology. Um, I had explored a lot of that literature during my PhD, um, but I decided not to use that conceptual framing of, of, of well-being and, and, and happiness um, in, in this research um, because uh, livability for me gave me the opportunity to think through um, subjective interpretations of people's um, lived experiences but also there's an opportunity to think through some ob some objective elements including um, elements that would be of use for policy and practice. Um, so that's my short answer. Okay, okay thank you. Well, let, 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 let's, let's deal with Richard's um, further, well, it's not one question, but it's, it's, it's a series of questions. And I mean, he saw lots of people walking and cycling in the films uh, as well as using boats. And um, he, 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 he wants to know to what extent learning from previous projects and a wider literature as has informed your project it, it, it most certainly has um the reason why there's several different um uh theoretical elements that came together for this project one is learning about um, cities that haven't been very well researched in um, in, geog in human geography and uh, in urban studies. And that is these regional, secondary, tertiary, small cities, towns. Um, th they're just not well researched. Um, and I actually have a book coming out, an edited volume on that with Rutledge later this year about these cities. They are different than mega cities and they warrant academic exploration because this is where people are living. We were talking about ECAD's really interested in migration. You know, what is that migration? What is the relationship with climate change? Um, but we didn't use the framing of migration for this project either. Instead, we wanted to learn about the lived experiences of who lives in cities, which is not just informal settlement dwellers. It's also local interpretations of the middle class and so we asked people who is the middle class and we wanted to understand what were their differences in understanding um, cities we also were interested in people's aspirations you know what do people hope for for their own lives and for their children and we actually found that over half the residents had no desire to migrate to another city that's really important information for local authorities when they think through who do they need to engage with and what types of infrastructure are necessary? Um, okay, so Hannah, so, I mean, Richard followed up by saying, you know, is, is, is the work um, externally benchmarked against previous research or is it entirely 
based on on the perceptions of those particular individuals and i suppose from what you're saying it's it's a mixture of both i mean the, the research was informed by your knowledge of this topic um and I, I, without putting words into your mouth, um, I imagine you'd be saying that you've, you've added something to the literature from, from this particular study. I think so. Um, and also ECAD was instrumental in this project in the respect that ECAD had already been working in Mongla and in Noapara to some extent. And so we had a his well, the project had a history through ECAD. Um, of, of, of having those relationships with the local authorities and the different communities so that we could literally come in and do relatively deep work in a short period of time. But that was only possible because of ECAD's expertise and, and ECAD's significant good relationships on a local level. Okay, I mean, you, you've, you've mentioned now in the course of, of that response um, something that one of our own colleagues here in Glasgow, Rona Brown, has put up. and. You know, why, why are small cities important? And I saw another response from uh, Moazim saying that uh, one one of one of the important uh, aspects of studying small cities is this issue of migration. That uh, improving living conditions in smaller cities may m mitigate the, the response of many individuals in small cities to 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 go to urban areas. Um, I suppose I would reflect myself that you know this this is an issue. Small places. Uh, are an issue all around the world and you know, even here in the UK we're finding those smaller places are, 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 are left behind um, I work with colleagues in Australia those small towns left behind in the bush and so on yeah so uh, is there anything else you'd you, you'd want to say about you know why it's important to to, to work on some of these smaller places um, I think they're really important spaces because the the ability to make a change is 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 um, almost easier or faster in these small cities because of those relationships and those and the ability to influence change, whether it's through those extended family networks or through different groups in, in the city. Um, and that's not a Bangladeshi insight that comes from other countries that I've worked in and other scholars that are working in, the, in this area. So, um, but yeah, thank you. And, and it's perhaps something we in SHLC overall recognize by the focus on the neighborhood where, yes. where, where, where we think we will get more important insights. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, can I can I go on um, to to um, some questions that have come from our funder, from from Claire Hunter Fennell from UKRI ESRC, uh, who tells us that it's a really interesting project, which is good to hear. Um, per, perhaps um, either you, Hannah, or or, or 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 one of your colleagues can can talk about. Um, the issue of capacity building of local researchers, which was mentioned at, at one point, and Claire is looking for some examples of, of, of how that happened. Well, either Alex or Istiak might might want to want to talk about that. Alex, Alex do you want to say something? Yes. Uh, I think it might be a good idea for Istiak to respond. Particularly in okay. Istiak, would you like to come back in on that question of giving us some examples of how uh, local researchers have, have, have benefited from this project? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, so in the process of our doing our research, we have kind of recruited a few students from Kulna University, where the still student and uh, studying in the university, we have recruited them to be part of the research project. And we have a uh, had them doing interviews, focus group discussion, and surveys. And throughout the process, we had like two in whole day training session for them to be uh, to make them better uh, able to do the research. Uh, at the same time, we also have uh, recruited two students from IUB as a photographer and filmmaker. They are also still students, and they wanted to have some uh, first hand experience in doing these uh, activities. So we also recruited them and trained them to how to do uh, or how to take photographs, what are the photographs they should take at the same time, uh, how to take the different clips from different uh, session that we had. At the same time, it was also a good learning experience for me because uh, I'm doing research on climate change for the last six years, but 
this was I, I i had in many cases i had few urban sites in few of the research projects but this one was fast that is entirely focused on urban research at the same time the livability concept is was really new to me i was not oriented with this concept and throughout the project i read a lot i i had to learn the concept better and now i think it's a really it's a new perception how we can go forward doing new research so this is how we have built capacity uh, the young researcher also involved from ecat side they are also included in the entire process the pro planning doing the budget and everything so it was a learning process for the entire team i hope thank you thank you ishtar um um sorry michael and i could just oh and that you want to say that. something okay go yes. ahead thank you so um and i might have missed this because there were my connection was went a bit unstable for a moment but also just to reflect that specifically the theater making colleague i worked with um who was from uh, the university of dak of Dhaka, he, uh, well, he had recently graduated. It was also an opportunity for him to kind of integrate really strong theater making skills he had to see how they could be used for research. So that was another element of, of developing, developing young researchers. Um, and something else that was just, is really nascent in our project and is not something that we had the scope time-wise to develop more, but in running the, the theater making workshops in particular, but also the interviews in a sense, was about enrolling local residents as researchers in the project. They were co-researching with us what livability is. Um, and that was particularly possible in the storytelling workshops because it's like, okay, let's investigate together. So over a longer term process, we would be able to nurture that more and this kind of idea of everyday citizens as researchers. Okay, thank you. Um, sure. Let's just stay with uh, Claire's questions. And uh, here's a tough one for you. Um, how do you think your work is going to influence policy? Um, and what strategies further information is needed to support effective policy making? Maybe it's not tough. Maybe you've done it. Um, can, I, can I take a stab at it? And then maybe Ishtia can respond. Okay. Um, it's important to understand that we had a six month funded project. Um, we're not a multi year project. So I think it's really important to remember the time frame in which we are engaging in. Um, we've continued it much longer than six months because we've really enjoyed the project, all of us, I think. Um, but there is huge potential for policy influence, um, but it requires sustained effort which our micro project does not have, but we will continue it through, I think through, through um, ECAD's work. Um, the local government officials uh, really appreciated some of the insights, some of the insights they argued with, um, but we also created a forum for local residents, informal settlement dwellers and middle-class residents to engage and be in the same meetings as the local government officials that is really significant, especially for women. So one of the photographs that Ishak showed was a woman in a red scarf who spoke for the first time in front of government officials. On a national level, um, the National Association of Municipalities, um, they were a bit, um, a bit uncomfortable with some of the things we were saying. Okay, they were also from the ruling party, but um, so I think, and also for us as um, researchers, we learned an awful lot in terms of um, how to work in an interdisciplinary fashion and the need to come up with uh, with similar dialogue and understandings of some concepts. And um, But I think that in terms of policy and advocacy work, I think this concept has a lot of traction because it's not resilience, it's not climate change mitigation, it's not migration studies. It's not disaster studies. So it sort of bridges um, many different types of silos, including hum humanitarian support. So it, it just, livability just sort of just cross is cross cutting and that makes it a bit easier to work with at times for policy work. Um, Ishtiak, do you want to add anything? Yeah, sure. So initially when we were discussing this project, the, one of the main objective that we had was to influence the local um, in municipalities because it's a six month project uh, with uh, like two or three months research. Uh, so, and we had like really tiny two uh, small cities uh, in the coastal belt. And what we actually did quite uh, 
effectively because the local government they were really interested uh, to learn more about this and the concept of livability one thing we really need to do going forward that i have learned through my experience is continuous communication with the local government it can be with the local government with the national government it at any level the continuous communication is really needed to push uh, any policy suggestion forward at the same time uh, while explaining it or presenting it to the national level uh, one suggestion was to look at a broader aspect like uh, the entire coastal belt because when they think of a national policy they can't think of only mongla or only noapara so we have to uh, in future maybe we will be able to do a, such a research that covers the entire coastal belt that can have a, a policy for the entire coastal belt at the same time one appreciation from the national level was uh, the concept of livability because a uh, few of them were saying like they heard of this concept before they studied it in the university but while working in the government they never worked with it and they were happy that we were working with it and they are looking forward uh, to have this type of research mode that bridges different issues that Hannah already mentioned and that will be uh, that concept will be able to solve a lot of uh, coordination problems that we are facing currently because we are working with migration but uh, where that's not linked with disaster maybe we are working with climate change but not linked with some other issues but with the livability concept if we do further research on a larger scale that can help to be all the issues and have a better policy going forward. Thank you, and I hope I answered it well. Okay, Ishtak, that's fine. Well, we, since we've come back to livability again, I, I'm just going to uh, ask you to respond to the question that uh, Lenny LaRue, who's doing a PhD in urban geography at the University of Oklahoma in the US, has just posed to us. Um, so for you, Hannah, so how might the conceptual framework for livability change in the future? Um, the implication here is that you, you, you've created a methodology that's given voice to locals and a, a more situated understanding of livability. So do you think that that's going to have a, um, some sort of impact on theoretical and underpinnings of, of livability? Um, I hope so. <laughs> um, I think as a team, that's what we're exploring now, is what are our emerging findings um, theoretically. Um, so that's what we're working through right now. Um, but if you could help us, that would be great. So we're really open to having a new group of scholars work on this with us um, in, in different places. Um, livability has been sort of mangled as a concept. Um, uh, because of the quantification of it. And I think that there's just a lot of scope for thinking through um, everyday lives in these small cities. Um, if we just open up a conceptual space um, to listen to people. Um, so yeah, but yeah, come help us out. Okay, thank you. Let, let's just go back to the approaches that you've used. So there was a question earlier on from Muazzam uh, from Islamabad in Pakistan who asks were, were officials from the, the, the two cities engaged in the process, in the, ex, in the research, and if not, why not? So I think you're saying, yes, they were. Can you just tell us how they were involved? Um, we, we uh, I think all of us on the team have always tried to engage with local government officials um, rather than just showing up on their door with our results, um, which is just not an effective strategy. Um, we, we got their we told them about what we wanted to do. So we had information sharing meetings before the project started. Um, we told them what we wanted to do, how we wanted to do it, where we wanted to do it. And um, we kept them involved through the process. Um, in, uh, in Noah Pada, we asked the mayor, for example, you know, what do you want from us? And he said, you know, if you can just give me some beautiful pictures of Noah Pada that I can use in my office, I'll be happy. So we did. Um, but I mean, it was, it was, it's more than that. Um, the local governments are aware of their issues. They're aware of, um, of, pub, of um, uh, of the inability of their inability to manage solid waste, for example, they say, "Help us find the money." You know, they they have they know their issues, but they their struggle with um, organizing the financing to address some of their infrastructure problems. So, which is not what we as academics can do. 
um, rather we can just uh, shed light and, and help to create um, openings for relationships to be made on a local level and, and on that uh, national level. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, maybe um, I can ask Istiak to respond as well as a bit being on the ground in, in Bangladesh. And um, in, in general, Istiak, uh, has this project improved the possibilities of being able to communicate with, with officials, the mayors of, of these cities? Uh, I will definitely say yes, because uh, even within those six or seven months, we have communicated with the local government at least seven to eight times where at least three or four times we have visited them in their office and we had a very informal discussion where we discussed a lot of issues that they are having, a lot of issues the people are having and how we can solve this. So going for, I will say we have created a platform, a relation with the local government where we can easily access them and we can discuss different issues, how we can improve those ones. Great, thank you. Um, now, I think we've got a, a, a couple of um, easy questions, uh, hopefully. Uh, uh, Ishraful from Bangladesh asks, is there any knowledge sharing in this project? I think that's not a too difficult one for, for you, Anna. Do you want to tell us what sort of knowledge sharing there is going to be? Uh, we've, we've, we've really spent a tremendous amount of time um, trying to create outputs that share knowledge in different forms. So we have those the visual representations through the photography exhibits. Um, we have the, the two videos. We have two blogs. We have um, one article in a national daily, the Dhaka Tribune. We have two emerging research papers, one academic reflections. I mean, I th those are a lot of outputs for a small project. Um, and I think that because we've all loved this work, we've really done a tremendous amount. Um, so I don't, I think we've done, oh, and we have the survey. So I think, um, so a lot of the work that we did was on the, on the household surveys of the middle class and informal settlement dwellers. And that survey is, is incredibly rich with data. And that um, will be on ICAD's website in the next week. Um, and it has 260 visuals, you know, pie charts, um, diagrams of really deep insights into these two cities. So we know how many people want to migrate to other spaces, how many want to stay. We know how much food people eat, how many times a day they eat. We know what types of food they eat. We know how much money they spend on education, on, um, uh, on food. We know what they think of their neighborhoods. We know what their social support systems are like, about education. What am I missing? We did all of those eight sections, livelihoods, food security, utilities, transport, health, education, housing, attitudes towards government, which to me now I've learned was really quite a sensitive area, um, which I didn't realize when I, when I started. Uh, safety and security, how different that is from our con conceptualizations of safety and security in terms of cameras. Um, so we have a lot of rich um, details that we're really happy to share with others. And they're, they're through ECAD's website. And for me, that was really important that we house that data, not at, not at SHLC or Durham or, or WITS, but through um, ECAD, because that's where it should be, because the, the knowledge was generated in Bangladesh and it should, it should really be there in terms of, um, of long-term development. So, um, so I really welcome people going to the, the data that we have and looking at it. And thinking through, you know, what it means for your own work, because I think that might answer some of the questions that you're posing on the on the chat, which I cannot answer at the moment. Okay, and um, of course, uh, that's that's very important that it, it, that, that it can be found through through Bangladesh, but it will be available on SHLC yeah. and, and in Durham and so on. Um, just a, 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 another question from Bangladesh, Nilopal asks us: Did you find any group? Who intend to migrate to other nearby places as against um, into urban places I suppose he's saying there. He's checked do you want to respond? But, uh, uh, here can you repeat sorry. Um, otherwise, so, otherwise so, 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 so a colleague in Bangladesh has, has said did you find any group 
um, with, within uh, the sample that um, wanted to migrate to other nearby places? Um, so both Mongla and Noapara are kind of emerging cities where we have, uh, in Mongla we have a port, seaport, and then we have an EPZ, uh, economic zone. And then in Noapara we have a, a river port and that, that's, that has an Indian border. So both has a lot of industrial uh, potential and that's how we have seen a lot of incoming migrants in those two cities. But at the same time, we haven't found that much uh, intention of going out of Mongla and Noapara. So that was one of our findings from the research that a lot of incoming migrants in Noapara and Mongla. And that's why one of the reasons to uh, kind of select those two cities to see if these are two emerging cities that has a potential to have a lot of new migrants in the future, how livable those cities are. Can I, can I also respond? Anna, um, no, Anna, no I'm, I'm going to hold you there because I'd rather us look at, look at um, um, a couple of other questions. There's, there's one from uh, Lucy, a uh, research fellow in Exeter, who's also working on one of the projects that, that we funded. Um, I wonder if you captured differences in the perceptions of participants who are native to the two cities versus those who have migrated to the cities. Did their perception of the city and what livability means constitutes differ. So if you could just rapidly answer that question, I'd like to fit in a couple more before we uh, come to the end. Again, we did not start the project from a migration angle. And that's really important. Um, and, and, and I think it sort of, sort of made uncomfortable some assumptions that maybe people had before they started the project. So because we did the, we did the um, survey of the 200 households anonymous um, in September, and then in October, we went and did the semi-structured interviews with you know, government officials and the residents um, and community leaders, as well as the street theater. So we couldn't, so because those projects were slightly done in parallel, we, we, it was only after we started to analyze the data did we start thinking about you know, specific, um, groups that we were more interested in and of course the migration came out at that point but that wasn't the entry point for the project and I think that's really important to consider and I think that's the value of this project is that we didn't come in from climate change migration humanitarian disasters okay um, okay um, let me go back to the question that Sharon Lewis posed she's working for UNOPS in Bangladesh and She's interested in the link between cost of living and quality of life. So she's asking a simple question. Did you gather any data on household spending on water and electricity and social services as, as example, as part of your processes? Ishak, do you want to answer or shall I? You can start and I can add maybe. Okay. We found that the cost of living was higher in Noapada than in Mangla. We found that, um, for example, the middle class uh, spent more money on a diversified uh, portfolio of food. Uh, and uh, we found that people were more comfortable in Noapada than in Mangla. So Mangla was- that the only relationship to quality of life indicators? We think as a team that Noapada is more livable now and will be more livable in the future. Mongla can be perceived as livable now, but it probably will struggle as a city long term because of its lack of access of drinkable water. And, this, and the second part of the question was uh, is purely factual. Did, did, did you gather data on household spending on, on water, electricity, social services? Um, We'll have is that, is that, is yeah. saying yes is that yeah we have a few data on how much they have they normally spend uh, on utilities and in few cases like in Mongla we have seen like even within Mongla different areas has to pay different uh, expenses or rates uh, sim uh, for example the water supply that they get from the municipalities in some area it's higher than the some uh, in other areas. At the same okay. time, just to add with I'm... Hannah, uh, sorry, just to add with Hannah, even when we have uh, kind of discussed and 
decided that Nuapara is more livable. When we were presenting our uh, findings, Nuapara people, they all have kind of showed a regret that they don't have a, a park that they can go and socialize and leisure, while Mongla has one. So even though uh, they have all the other, other utilities, they are lacking on some like, aspects as well. Okay. Um, and I'm sure if, if, if people in this um, webinar have got specific questions, any of you be willing to answer some of these outside this webinar. So I think I'm going to come on to, 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 to a last question. Alex, you haven't, you haven't spoken for a little while, so I, I'm going to ask you if you'll answer this one. It's from uh, Rihanna Ferdus, who's uh, one of my colleagues in the School of Education here at the University of Glasgow. And um, can you... Um, Comment, it's a methodological question, really. How, how did you choose the neighbourhoods and uh, the households and what factors determine the social class of the neighbourhood or household that you interviewed? So, so how did you choose the ha households and um, what's the measure of social class if, if it's social class that you use to, yes. to, to get your sample? Great. So, first of all, both cities are quite small. So... Um, and ECAD researchers had worked in, in the cities before. So uh, choice in a way feels a little bit strong, and Ishtia could jump in here, but it was a matter of just arriving in the cities and approaching households as, as walking through them. Um, the informal settlements were easier to identify, and again, Ishtia could just please do qualify anything I'm saying. So... Um, and more and are more accessible because there's less of a barrier between the, the private and public space and the informal settlements. In terms of locating middle class people to, to interview, um, in Noapara, there were some personal connections with researchers from ECAD, so that was a way in. Uh, one of our researchers, her grandfather, uh, was a city official there, so that, that led to quite easily to f accessing middle class participants. But uh, in Manga specifically, and also to an extent in Noapara, it was a matter of saying, where do the middle class people live to people on the street? And, and, it, and people were directed, our researchers were directed towards middle class areas. So it was something that was a public perception. And, and in terms of earning, the people we were surveying in those middle class areas weren't all necessarily earning in a middle class income bracket, but they were living within that area. So it was, uh, it was adjudicated very much according to kind of geographic location. Thank, thank you, Alex. Um, uh, I'm going to hold you, time. Anna, because we've, mm -hmm. we've only got three minutes left. And um, so I need to do a little wrap up now. Um, so that's been, I hope for everyone who's been listening, uh, a, a really interesting set of presentations. And um, each of our speakers has, has, has presented extremely well, uh, great visuals. Um, I think you've given us a really strong taste of the work that you did. And as you've pointed out yourselves, you did that with relatively little funding. And I congratulate you for what you've achieved in that short period of time. Just three observations from me just at this point. Um, I think, as I indicated earlier, a focus on smaller cities, smaller places, left behind places, anywhere in the world, I think is very important. Most of the big initiatives in the world, the urban initiatives, tend to be around big mega cities and so on. And we tend to forget these smaller places. Um, I think uh, we haven't mentioned this. It's really interesting how many uh, GCRF funded projects are using arts based approaches. And I don't know how many colleagues from the arts and humanities are in this webinar, but I would say to them, you know, if you think there isn't research for you to do uh, in, in, in GCRF and, and, and related international development projects, you're very wrong. And people are looking for your expertise uh, when it comes to, to, to your work, no matter where you're based in terms of disciplinarity. And the other simple thing is, we, we, we often um, talk about um, impact and, and um, we're all doing impact case studies through the research excellence framework in the UK and, and so on. And I think we forget how difficult it is to ch achieve impact in these small projects. And so some very small things like bringing people together, allowing citizens to meet with the mayor 
to have those communications is actually a much greater achievement than some people who are used to traditional uh, signs of impact know. So I'm going to stop there. I thank you for your, your presentations and I thank everyone who's posed some great questions and everyone who's been listening during the course of the last 90 minutes. And I'm going to hand back to Gail, 30 seconds too late. <laughs> Thank you very much for keeping us to time. We're pretty much bang on time, so thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to say a final thank you to everybody for joining us today. It's been an excellent webinar. I know I've certainly learned a lot, so a special thank you to our speakers today as well. Um, don't worry if you didn't capture everything while we were um, talking throughout the webinar. I will, in the course of the next day or so, send an email to everyone with a link to the recordings and the presentations. And Ishtak, I'll get that link from you from your website where all of the information is collected and um, but also know that it will all be collected on our website as well and um, so just to say thank you again for joining please do sign up to our newsletter check and keep an eye on our website we've got lots of other seminars coming up soon and um, so please do keep an eye on that and that's it from us today I'll, I'll keep the the webinar going for a little bit if anyone wants to chat in the chat room but um, that's it from us today folks thank you again for joining us